Hello and good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Hero Act Refresher webinar presentation this afternoon. My name is Kathy Curry. I'm a marketing manager at Bond. I'd just like to go over two quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. This is a 30 minute presentation, but we will do our best to address those as time allows throughout the program. Once the webinar has ended, if you would just take a quick moment to complete the survey, we'd appreciate it. Your comments and suggestions are helpful to our panelists and provide us with topics for future topics. So I'd now like to introduce Adam Master Leo to start, our, start us off today. Kathy, thank you so much and welcome to everybody who is joining us this afternoon. We know, uh, well, I know based upon the number of calls I've gotten over the last uh, two days, how important this topic is for everyone. Uh, there have been some critical developments relating to the HERO Act, and we plan to cover those with you today. So today you're gonna to be hearing from myself as well as Stephanie Fedorka. Stephanie has presented on these HERO Act issues several times before, and uh, we thought it only appropriate to bring Stephanie back now that um, the plans have been activated. So what we're going to do first is provide a recap and Stephanie is going to take care of that. So Stephanie, please take it away. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know I have also gotten a lot of emails and calls, and there's a lot of questions that we hopefully will answer for you today. Um, so a quick recap on the New York HERO Act. As we've previously discussed, this was broken down. It was two parts, really. The first part is the Airborne Infectious Disease Exposure Prevention Plans. Uh, that's New York Labor Law Section 218B that was added. Uh, that became effective July 4th and it applies to all private employers um, in New York State with work sites in New York State. That's the focus of today's discussion, really. The second piece is on the workplace safety committees. That was um, as part of the new addition to the New York labor law under Section 27D. That does not become effective until November 1st of this year, and that provision of the New York HERO Act only applies to private employers with at least 10 employees. We won't be focusing our discussion today, but there will surely be more to come on that as uh, we get closer to that November 1st deadline. Next slide, please. So quickly, who is covered? Uh, what, who does this law uh, apply to? It only applies to private employers. Uh, the law is very clear in the definition of employers and employees that public employers are not subject to this law. Uh, it covers a broad range of workers. So you might've recalled or noticed that the definition of employees was not just your uh, run of the mill definition of employees that we frequently encounter in our practice or in your uh, workforces. This includes things like independent contractors, et cetera. So it covers a broad range of workers. Uh, it only applies to an airborne infectious agent or disease designated uh, by the Commissioner of Health as a highly contagious communicable disease that presents a serious risk of harm to the, to the public health, which is why we're here with you today. Um, the standard is clear that it does not apply to any seasonal endemic infectious disease like the flu. Um, and it does not apply, the standard I should note, not the law necessarily, but the standard does not apply to any employee within coverage of a temporary or permanent standard adopted by OSHA uh, that covers uh, standards regarding COVID-19 and or airborne infectious disease. And uh, Stephanie, let me, let me pause there for a second because I've seen this question already in the chat, or excuse me, in the Q&A. Um, if you are an employer like a hospital that is subject to OSHA's temporary emergency temporary standard, does the HERO Act apply? I think the answer is yes, the HERO Act still applies for a couple technical reasons. One is that the HERO Act is broader than just COVID-19, um, but the HERO Act requires that development by, uh, of the standard, the Airborne Infectious Disease Exposure Prevention Standard, and that may not apply to employees that are covered by that OSHA reg, uh, standard. I hope that so answers words, your question. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, if you are a hospital subject to the OSHA emergency temporary standard, you don't have to have this model plan that is provided by uh, the State Department of Health under the HERO Act plan. You have your separate requirements for a plan under the emergency temporary standard. Correct. Right now, that standard would apply because this designation has been made for COVID-19, which we're going to dive into. Uh, because there is an applicable OSHA standard, that will apply. 
if uh, you're in the healthcare setting. Where it may become gray is if you're not sure if it applies to you or there are several technical exceptions, um, then that's a great opportunity to call one of us or your labor and employment attorney to confirm exactly what you should adopt, what has to go into play when, um, et cetera. So in July, uh, the Department of Labor, pursuant to its requirements under the New York Here Act, that's Section 218B of the New York Labor Law, uh, published three documents. One is the Airborne Infectious Disease Exposure Prevention Standard, which we will reference. That is currently uh, an emergency regulation, and it is actually on its way to becoming a regulation in and of itself. And that sets forth the minimum standards and requirements of what employers have to have in their workplaces, um, et cetera. They also published the, a general model airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plan and several 11 to be specific, industry specific model airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plans. Next slide, please. When we're talking about the plans, the plans had to require these topics as per the statute and as per the standard. So the model plans incorporate and address all of those uh, requirements or procedures that I'm sure many of you have questions about, employee health screenings, face coverings, required PPE, hand hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the things that needed to be in those plans and that are in those model plans. Um, and if you, when we go into the next slide, we'll talk about what that requirement was for adoption of a plan. Next slide, please. So the critical compliance deadlines, uh, adoption of the plan was required by August 5th. All private employers uh, must adopt either a prevention plan or an alternative plan that meets or exceeds the minimum standard um, and requirements. Special rules apply in creating that alternative plan. So employers could either adopt that model plan or an industry specific plan, or they could adopt an alternative plan. But if an employer is going to create an alternative plan, it either needs to be with an agreement, if you're in a collective bargaining setting, unionized workforce, it has to be pursued to an agreement with a collective bargaining representative, or even in non-unionized settings, the law requires, quote unquote, meaningful participation from employees with respect to development of that plan as well. In addition, that alternative plan would have to be tailored and specific to hazards um, in that specific industry and work sites. In addition to that, there was a verbal review requirement. Um, employers must conduct a verbal review of policies, employees, statutory rights, and the prevention plan. It is clear from the standard and the model plan that that has to occur during an outbreak, during a designation um, of the airborne infectious disease. A little bit less clear and some conflicting information from the standard and the model plan whether or not some verbal review is required before. Um, but that's neither here nor there at this point, since we have, we are under such a designation at this time. So we'll really focus on what that verbal review will look like in a couple of slides. Next slide, please. Written notice and posting. The statute requires that employers provide a copy of the adopted plan to all employees in their primary language um, within 30 days of adoption or with this initial rollout within 60 days from the New York State Department of Labor's uh, date of publishing those model standards. So that came to September 4th. Um, you also have to post the plan in a visible and prominent location in each work site. This does not include vehicles um, and other additional scenarios. Uh, when you have to provide a copy of the plan include 15, within 15 days, if you have to close because of an airborne infectious disease. So I don't think we're going to see, we may see that going forward, but last summer where uh, businesses might have had to close down due to uh, an airborne infectious disease due to COVID-19, now under this new law, within 15 days of reopening, you would have to provide employees with another copy of your uh, exposure prevention plan. In addition, new hires all have to receive a copy of the plan upon hire as well. A copy must also be included in the employee handbook. A common question I have received a lot is, can we just put uh, a link? Do we have to put the complete plan in the employee handbook? Based on the language in the statute, um, it seems to refer to it as the 
employee or the Airborne Infectious Disease Exposure Prevention Plan, which to me suggests that it has to be a complete copy of the plan um, that needs to be added to your handbook as well. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the training, um, which Adam will talk to you about in a few slides, once these plans are activated after a designated, um, during a designation that we're in right now, there are training obligations that come with that as well. Next slide, please. And I'll hand it back to Adam to touch base with you on, on this piece. Okay, so this is why you're all here today. Stephanie, thank you for that review. On Monday, the governor issued a directive to the commissioner of health, um, which the commissioner of health took and issued a designation of COVID-19 as an airborne or highly contagious airborne infectious disease. This is what uh, it says on New York's HERO Act website. I would recommend that if you're curious about what the HERO Act requires, just Google New York HERO Act. The state has its own website set up where it provides all the information uh, that you might need to analyze a question. But this is what you see right on the front page. Um, like I said, on September 6th, the Commissioner of Health issued this uh, designation. The designation is actually shown in the picture on the right side of the screen here. And there are a couple of things I would point out in the designation for everyone to pay attention to. First of all, uh, and most importantly, um, COVID-19 has now been designated. So that means these are the magic words, like it says on the slide, you gotta activate your plan. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The other important thing I think from the designation is that it expires as written on September 30th. It is right now September 8th. So that means this activation is only good for the next 22 days. If my math is correct, and I am not a math major, but I think that's right. Um, at the end of or leading up to September 30th, the Commissioner of Health and the Governor's Office are going to, as it says in the designation, reassess and make a determination about whether or not they're going to extend this designation. So for now, it only goes to September 30th, they will reassess at the end of the month. Okay, so now, I, I, before I turn it back over to Stephanie to talk about this, there are certain things that are in that standard that you have to do once this designation is made. And that's why I'm sure you all are on today. So Stephanie is gonna start with what things you have to do now that a designation has been made. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so as Adam suggests or noted, the standard is a very important, um, it has very important information it, in section B8 specifically. It provides this language in there and it gives employers an outline of what they have to do with respect to implementation of the exposure prevention plans. So the designation's been made, you have to activate your plans. What do you have to do? And the standard provides that you, employers should uh, do an immediate review of the exposure prevention plan, update it if that's appropriate um, to ensure it incorporates current information, guidance, mandatory requirements under the federal, state, or local governments um, related to the infectious agent of concern. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides, just based on where we are at currently uh, with guidance from the state and the CDC. Uh, then you have to finalize and promptly activate your plan. Provide the verbal review. Uh, provide employees, each employee with a copy of the exposure prevention plan in English or in their identified primary language. Again, there are Spanish copies all on the New York State HERO Act website. Uh, they have not published any other languages at this time. Uh, therefore, if you have any other language, that may not be, where a copy may not be available at this time, based on the language in the statute, an English copy would be sufficient. If in the future, the New York State Department of Labor issues other languages, uh, then you would be obligated to provide a copy in another language if your employee identifies that language as their primary language. In addition, you have to post a copy of the exposure prevention plan in a visible and prominent location, which I'm sure many of you have already done. But I think this is just to reiterate that if you've updated anything um, to 
post an updated copy, distribute an updated copy if you've made changes um, to your plan at all. Another note is in your plans, um, especially if you adopted one of the model plans, you'll notice at the very end or near the very end, there is a chart to record and log any updates that you make. So if you do make an update to your plan, I would be sure to update and put that into your log in your plan as well. Then ensure that a copy of the exposure prevention plan is accessible to employees during all work shifts. So this comes straight from the standard. It's very clear what your uh, tasks are and your to-do list is right now, at least part of it. Next slide, please. Before we move on, I just wanna highlight a couple of things. Well, first of all, the plans that you all adopted, which were most likely based upon the model plans the state provided, are very different than the reopening plans that you all were required to put into place last year. The reopening guidance and the reopening plans were much more specific and provided you with much more direction on exactly what you had to do. These model plans give you a lot more wiggle room. So for those of you who put them into place, you know, you could check off certain things that you felt were appropriate. It uses words like avoid unnecessary gathering. Well, that requires some uh, discretion on your part in terms of deciding what is a necessary gathering or not. So you, I'm sure you're all gonna have lots of questions on what specifically we have to do or what, what's required. We're gonna talk about what is specifically required and, and Stephanie's going over some of that now, but there are a lot of issues that aren't determined by these model plans that are going to require some discretion. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that before we move on. All right, Stephanie, uh, keep going, I'll switch. Yeah, next slide, please, thanks. Uh, so while the designation is in effect, it's important to know that you need to have uh, an assigned or a designated uh, supervisory employee that is going to have enforcement responsibilities to ensure that enforcement takes place. The whole point of this law, the whole point of having these plans in place is to prevent uh, exposure to COVID-19 or any other airborne infectious disease that would be so designated um, in the workplace and protecting your employees and others from exposure and uh, mitigating or reducing spread. Um, in addition, you have to monitor and maintain the exposure controls, follow updates to guidance. This is critical. A lot of the standard, as Adam alluded to, gives you leeway. A lot of it will say, um, you know, as provided or in accordance with guidance. So if there is no active guidance, you have some leeway, but it's important. And I think it's phrased that way so that if applicable guidance comes out, the expectation would be that you are following said guidance. So making sure that whoever that individual is that is responsible for enforcement of these plans or uh, you know the keepers of these plans, if you will, updating them is following um, updates and is apprised of uh, status of different uh, guidance that may come out. Next slide, please. So next steps, just breaking it down further, um, review your plan. So right now, I think the first thing, if you haven't already done so, is familiarize yourself with the exposure controls that you need to have in place and consider what exposure controls you can or should have in place. As Adam noted, there are certain provisions in the standard that are clear, those minimum controls that have to be in place that don't really provide you with much wiggle room versus others where you could check off the boxes of which types of controls you anticipate to implement. Uh, what makes sense for your workplace? Um, where are potential exposures likely to happen? Um, familiarize yourself with the standard itself. As I said, this is very important. This is the guiding document, really, and what um, it lays out what the expectations are. And it is an emergency regulation. Um, currently, and it's like I mentioned before as well, it's on its way to becoming a full regulation. It's in that rulemaking process. And then be prepared to change or update your plan to reflect guidance. So stay abreast of updates. If we have different mandates that come out, especially now that we have a new governor, um, we may see, and as we're entering into fall, the Delta variant um, is not necessarily lowering in it or reducing in numbers. Um, 
we may see changes. So staying on top of those and making sure that you are updating your employees, updating your plans as appropriate to make sure you're following those uh, that guidance. Once you've done that, finalize and activate your plans. Uh, provide a verbal review and training to all of your employees, which Adam will get uh, give you more details on in a, a slide or two. Uh, and make sure you're providing updated copies of your plans to your employees. Um, it's posted uh, and it's accessible as noted. Next slide, please. I think okay. this is on to you, Adam. Yes, it is. Thanks, Steph. Okay, so one of the things that has caused some confusion for clients is this requirement of, of a verbal review and or training. So there's a little bit of a difference in what the standard says and what the model plans say. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about both. So the standard says the employer shall conduct a verbal review of employer policies, employer rights under the standard and section 218B of the labor law and the employer's exposure pre prevention plan set forth herein. Um, but the standard implies that that verbal review only has to be disseminating a copy of the plan to your employees and posting it at your work site. However, the model plans that you all adopted have very specific language regarding training that you have to provide verbally via either electronic means, in person, et cetera. And here's what the plans say about this training. So the plans say that once the plan is activated, so that's now, plan's been activated. So this is for everybody. Once the plan is activated, all personnel will receive training, which will cover all elements of the plan and the, including the following topics. So you have to provide a training on the infectious agent and the disease. So what COVID-19 is, the signs and symptoms of the disease, how the disease can be spread, uh, an explanation of the plan itself, the activities and locations at your work site that may involve exposure to the infectious agent, the use and limitations of its exposure controls and a review of the standard. So these are things that you have to provide in a training to your employees according to what is in the plan. So that this is in everybody's model plan. If you use the model plan, then this is in there. The plan also goes on to say that the training has to be provided at no cost to the employees. It has to take place during working hours. Um, you know, the, the important thing I think here is that it has to be verbal, provided in person or through telephonic, electronic, or other means. So for uh, different industries, they, this may mean different things. We are an office setting, for example, so that we're a law firm. And one of the ways that we could potentially uh, conduct this training would be to prepare a video and disseminate it to all employees and have make sure all employees watch the video. That's one way to do it in an office setting. Here are some examples. You could pre-record a training session. Some of you already do this for various HR trainings. You pre-record it, uh, have your employees walk through it and confirm that they finished it. You could do a Zoom meeting. So depending on the size of your workforce, you could have all employees or groups of employees attend a Zoom, a live action Zoom training. You could do a pre-shift meeting for some of you who, for example, are in the manufacturing industry. You have your employee pre-shift meeting anyway, you could incorporate that into the pre-shift meeting. For those of you who are small employers, you could also have an in-person meeting. So you could just gather your employees at a particular time and go through the training. Um, so this is something, these are issues that I know you all are facing, but this is something that according to the plans has to be done. Okay, so Stephanie and I put together a list of FAQs that we've been getting. Oops, sorry about that. Um, we've answered some of them and I will say, I appreciate the questions that you all have been giving us I can tell you that we have approximately 150 questions in the Q&A, so there's no way we're possibly going to get to all of those. We're going to try to hit some of these highlights and then walk through some of the questions in the Q&A uh, to the extent we have time, but let, let's get right to it. Can we make changes to our plan? So Stephanie, why don't you take that one? Yeah, like we mentioned earlier, I think the answer is yes. There are charts in there to log your changes. So right now, actually, the Department of Labor, the standard is saying you should review your plan and 
make changes if that's appropriate. If you uh, weren't as specific enough in addressing or checking off what exposure controls you were going to implement, now may be the time to do that. Um, so you certainly can make changes to your plan. I think uh, if you're doing it from the model plan, log it in your uh, chart. If you are making changes to your alternative plan, I would also log it, but there may be additional obligations with respect to if you're changing it from the model plan to now an alternative plan, then that might require further consultation from uh, you know, legal counsel on what that might entail as well. And I saw a question in the Q&A about that participation from employees. That only applies if you are going to adopt a plan that is not the model plan. So if you go outside of the model plan and try to put together your own plan, then you have to have meaningful employee participation. Okay, number two, do we now have to require our employees to wear masks at work? Stephanie. So I've gotten this one a lot. As you likely noticed in your in the standard and in the model plans, there was language that suggests that employees will wear masks to the extent uh, possible during the workday, um, when, particularly when they cannot social distance um, in accordance with existing guidance. So I think based on the language in the standard, on top of that, we have the CDC guidance, which currently suggests that all or recommends that all uh, individuals vaccinated or not when you're in an indoor setting in an area of higher substantial transmission, which all of New York State is currently, uh, that the recommendation is to be um, masked up indoors um, as well. So I think based on that, on top of that, we still have the New York State Department of Health uh, emergency regulation that requires unvaccinated individuals to wear masks. So I think taking all of those things together, I think, yes, I think right now, masks are required if they individuals cannot socially distance. Yeah, and I mean, some of this stuff is going to be best practice as opposed to what exa is exactly required. So I think that's best practice at this point is to mandate masks. Um, all right, next question. The standard and the model plans include information about health screenings. Does this mean we now have to resume doing the health screenings? The answer is yes. This is one of the things that is pretty clear in the standard that you do have to start doing health screenings again. I saw a question in the Q&A. Can we not screen vaccinated people? No, that's not what the standard says. You have to start screening every employee before every shift. Okay, question. This is a good one. This is one I've been getting. What screening process are we required to implement? What the standard says is that the screening process has to be like I said, every before every shift, and it has to follow state and CDC guidance. Unfortunately, at this point, there is no clear state or CDC guidance on what would be an adequate screening. So the safest approach would be to utilize whatever screening procedure that you were utilizing uh, as of June of this year, right before the uh, emergency order, uh, the governor's emergency uh, standards went away. So that's the state safest approach. Just readopt what you were doing before. I saw a number of questions in the Q&A about whether you have to screen about travel. The answer would be no, because the most recent travel guidance from New York State is that there is no travel quarantine required anymore. So the travel question would be irrelevant. Um, again, I would recommend you just pick up whatever screening you were doing right before it stopped. Okay, next one. Do I need a HERO Act plan if I have fewer than blank, put your number in, employees? Stephanie. Yes. Um, as noted, uh, this applies to this part of the HERO Act plan, I should say, applies to all private employers in New York State. There is no number threshold with respect to this aspect of the HERO plan. Um, I have seen, I think there might be some confusion because the second part of the HERO Act um, that addresses the workplace safety committees has a numerosity threshold of 10, but for purposes of our discussion today in these airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plans, all private employers uh, must adopt a plan. All right, and last, when do I have to activate my plan? So here's what the standard says. The standard says that you have to review the plan immediately and you have to promptly activate it. So does that mean yesterday? Does that mean tomorrow? I think just do it as quickly as you can. 
Um, promptly is not a specific timeline, but it means do it with some expediency. So get it in place and get it working um, as quickly as you can. All right, it is 3.30. Um, judging by the number of questions that we've gotten, I think we need to do another one of these uh, for FAQs. Um, I would say to everyone, please keep on the lookout. We, we have a record of the questions that you've asked so we can mine those and uh, put together an FAQ presentation, hopefully in the next couple of days for you. So please keep your eyes out for that. Thank you to everyone for attending. We know this is a uh, busy time and there are a lot of questions. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you again, either in the next couple of days or next Tuesday during our weekly webinar. So thank you, take care.